Hi, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. Today I'm going to be sharing with you the first chapter of one of my favorite fantasy books. It is called Inkheart by Cornelia Funka. But before I read this first chapter aloud to you, I want to tell you four special things about this book. The first thing that I want to tell you about this book is that it is a series. So if you are someone who likes to read a series, always knowing that you're going to have another book coming up, uh, this is a perfect fantasy series for you. The second book in the series is called Ink Spell, and the third book in the series is called Ink Death. The second thing I want to tell you is that this first book in the series has been turned into a movie. So if you are someone who likes to read a book and then watch the movie, this is another great choice for you. Uh, I will tell you that just like most instances where this happens, I didn't love the movie quite as much as I love the book, but hey, it's still there and exciting. The third thing I want to tell you that you might not know, and I didn't know the first time I read this book, is that the author, Cornelia Funke, is actually German. This book was first written in German and then later translated into English. For this reason, um, it would not make it eligible for the Newbery Award. So if you and your class are learning about the Newbery Award and you're wondering why some books won awards and others don't, remember that the Newbery Award has to be written by an American author. And so even though Inkheart is an amazing book, it wouldn't be qualified for that award. And then the last thing I want to tell you is that when I was teaching middle school, I had my students choose an author and write to them. And one of my students wrote to Cornelia Funka and sent her their questions and, and this lovely letter across the sea, and Cornelia responded. Um, it was a printed letter on beautifully illustrated paper, um, but it did have her um, real signature and ink on it, which was very cool. Uh, so if you are interested in communicating with Cornelia, um, or any author for that matter, um, drop them a, a letter, snail mail I think works best, um, and then just see what happens. So um, going along with that magic of stories and words, I'm going to read you the blurb on the back of the book, and then we'll dive right into chapter one. One cruel night, Maggie's father reads aloud from Inkheart, and an evil ruler named Capricorn escapes the boundaries of the book, landing in their living room. Suddenly, Maggie's in the middle of the kind of adventure she thought only took place in fairy tales. Somehow, she must master the magic that has conjured up this nightmare. Can she change the course of the story that has changed her life forever? Um... As a word nerd, I, I love books about books. I love books about reading. Um, and I have a special place in my heart for books that have magic. And this book is all of those things. So, chapter one of Inkheart by Cornelia Funka. Chapter one is called A Stranger in the Night. The moon shone in the rocking horse's eye and in the mouse's eye too when Tolly fetched it out from under his pillow to see. The clock went tick-tock, and in the stillness he thought he heard little bare feet running across the floor, then laughter and whispering, and a sound like the pages of a big book being turned over. This is a quote from the book The Children of Green Know by L. M. Boston. Rain fell that night, a fine whispering rain. Many years later, Maggie had only to close her eyes and she could still hear it, like tiny fingers tapping on a window pane. The dog barked somewhere in the darkness, and however often she tossed and turned, Maggie couldn't get to sleep. The book she'd been reading was under her pillow, pressing its cover against her ear as if to lure her back into its printed pages. I'm sure it must be very comfortable sleeping with a hard rectangular thing like that under your head, her father had teased the first time he found a book under her pillow. Go on, admit it. The book whispers its story to you at night. Sometimes, yes, Maggie had said, but it only works for children which made Mo tweak her nose. Mo, Maggie had never called her father anything else. That night, when so much began and so many things changed forever, Maggie had one of her favorite books under her pillow. And since the rain wouldn't let her sleep, she sat up, rubbed the drowsiness from her eyes, and took it out. Its pages rustled promisingly when she opened it. Maggie thought this first whisper sounded a little different from one book to another, depending on whether or not she already knew the story it was going to tell her but she needed light. She had a box of matches hidden in the drawer of her bedside table. Mo had forbidden her to light candles at night. He didn't like fire. Fire devours books, he always said. 
but she was 12 years old and surely she could be trusted to keep an eye on a couple of candle flames. Maggie loved to read by candlelight. She had five candlesticks on the window sill, and she was just holding the lighted match to one of the black wicks when she heard footsteps outside. She blew out the match in alarm. Oh, how well she remembered it even many years later, and knelt to look out the window, which was wet with rain. And then she saw him. The rain cast a kind of pallor on the darkness, and the stranger was little more than a shadow. Only his face gleamed white as he looked up at Maggie. His hair clung to his wet forehead. The rain was falling on him, but he ignored it. He stood there motionless, arms crossed over his chest as if that might at least warm him a little. And he kept on staring at the house. I must go and wake Mo, thought Maggie. But she stayed put, her heart thudding and went on gazing out into the night as if the stranger's stillness had infected her. Suddenly, he turned his head, and Maggie felt as if he were looking straight into her eyes. She shot off the bed so fast the open book fell to the floor, and she ran barefoot out into the dark corridor. This was the end of the May. It was still chilly in the house, though. There was still a light on in Moe's room. He often stayed up late into the night, reading. Maggie had inherited her love of books from her father. When she took refuge from a bad dream with him, nothing could lull her to sleep better than Moe's calm breathing beside her, and the sound of the pages turning. Nothing chased away nightmares faster than the rustle of printed paper. But the figure outside the house was no dream. The book Mo was reading that night was bound in pale blue linen. Later, Maggie remembered that, too. What unimportant little details stick into the memory. Mo, there's someone out in the yard. Her father raised his head and looked at her with the usual absent expression he wore when she interrupted his reading. It always took him a few moments to find his way out of that other world, the labyrinth of printed letters. Someone in the yard? Are you sure? Yes, he's staring at our house. Mo put down his book. So what were you reading before you went to bed? Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Maggie frowned. Please, Mo, come and look. He didn't believe her, but he went anyway. Maggie tugged him along the corridor so impatiently that he stubbed his toe on a pile of books, which was hardly surprising. Stacks of books were piled high all over the house, not just arranged in neat rows on bookshelves the way other people kept them. Oh, no. The books in Mo and Maggie's house were stacked under tables, on chairs, and in the corners of the rooms. There were books in the kitchen and books in the lavatory, books on the TV set and in the closet, small piles of books, tall piles of books, books thick and thin, books old and new. They welcomed Maggie down to breakfast with invitingly open pages, they kept boredom at bay when the weather was bad, and sometimes you fell over them. He's just standing there, Maggie whispered, leading Mo into her room. Has he got a hairy face? If so, he could be a werewolf. Oh, stop it, Maggie looked at him sternly, although his jokes made her feel less scared. Already, she hardly believed any more in the figure standing in the rain, until she knelt down at the window again. There, do you see him? she whispered. Mo looked out through the raindrops running down the pane and said nothing. Didn't you promise burglars would never break into our house because there's nothing here to steal? whispered Maggie. He's not a burglar, replied Mo. But as he stepped back from the window, his face was so grave that Maggie's heart thudded faster than ever. Go back to bed, Maggie, he said. The visitor has come to see me. He left the room before Maggie could ask what kind of visitor, for goodness sake, turned up in the middle of the night. She followed him anxiously. As she crept down the corridor, she heard her father taking the chain off the front door, and when she reached the hall, she saw him standing in the open doorway. The night came in dark and damp, and the rushing of the rain sounded loud and threatening. Dust finger, Mo called into the darkness. Is that you? Dust finger? What kind of name was that? Maggie couldn't remember ever hearing it before, yet it sounded familiar, like a distant memory that wouldn't take shape properly. At first, all that seemed still outside, except for this falling rain, murmuring, murmuring as if the night had found its voice. But then footsteps approached the house, and the man emerged from the darkness of the yard, his long coat so wet with rain that it clung to his legs. For a split second, as a stranger stepped into the light spilling out of the house, Maggie thought she saw a small furry head over his shoulder, snuffling as it looked out of his backpack, and then quickly disappearing back in. Dustfinger wiped his wet face with his sleeve and offered his hand to Mo. "'How are you, Silver Tongue? he asked. "'It's been a long time.' Hesitantly, Mo took the outstretched hand. A very long time, he said, looking past his visitor, as if he expected to see another figure emerge from the night. Come in, you'll catch your death. Maggie says you've been standing out there for some time. 
Meggie? Ah, yes, of course. Dustfinger let Mo lead him into the house. He scrutinized Meggie so thoroughly she felt quite embarrassed and didn't know where to look. In the end, she just stared back. She's grown. You remember her? Of course. Meggie noticed that Mo double locked the door. How old is she now? Dustfingo smiled at her. It was a strange smile. Meg Maggie couldn't decide whether it was mocking, supercilious, or just awkward. She didn't smile back. Twelve, said Mo. Twelve, my word. Dustfinger pushed his dripping hair back from his forehead. It reached almost to his shoulders. Maggie wondered what color it was when it was dry. The stubble around his narrow-lipped mouth was gingery, like the fur of a stray cat Maggie sometimes fed with a saucer of milk outside the door. Ginger hair sprouted on his cheeks, too, sparse as a boy's first beard, but not long enough to hide three long, pale scars. They made Dustfinger's face look as if it had been smashed and stuck back together again. Twelve, he repeated. Of course, she was... Let's see, she was three then, wasn't she? Mo nodded. Come on, I'll find you some dry clothes. Impatiently, as if he were suddenly in a hurry to hide the man from Maggie, he led his visitor across the hall. And Maggie, he said over his shoulder, you go back to sleep. Then without another word, he closed his workshop door. Maggie stood there, rubbing her cold feet together. Go back to sleep? Sometimes when they'd stayed up late, yet again, Mo would toss her down on her bed like a bag of walnuts. Sometimes he chased her around the house until after supper, until she escaped to her room, breathless with laughter. And sometimes he was so tired he lay down on the sofa and she made him a cup of coffee before she went to bed. But he had never, ever sent her off to bed so brusquely. A foreboding, clammy and fearful, came into her heart, as if along with a visitor whose name was so strange yet somehow familiar, some menace had slipped unknowingly into her life. And she wished, so hard it frightened her, that she had never gone to get Mo, and Dustfinger had stayed outside until the rain washed him away. When the door of the workshop opened again, she jumped. Still there, I see, said Mo. Go to bed, Maggie, please. He had thrown, he had that little frown over his nose that appeared only when something was really worrying him, and he seemed to look straight through her as if his thoughts were somewhere else entirely. The foreboding in Maggie's heart grew, spreading black wings. Send him away, Mo, she said, as gently propelled, as he gently propelled her to her room. Please send him away. I don't like him. Mo leaned in her open doorway. He'll be gone when you get up in the morning. Word of honor. Word of honor? No crossed fingers? Maggie looked him straight in the eye. She could always tell when Mo was lying, however hard he tried to hide from her. No crossed fingers, said Mo, holding both his hands out to show her. Then he closed her door, even though he knew she didn't like that. Maggie put her ear to it, listening. She could hear the clink of china. So the man with a sandy beard was getting a nice cup of tea to warm him up. I hope he catches pneumonia, thought Maggie, though he needn't necessarily die of it. Maggie heard the kettle whistling in the kitchen and Mo carrying a tray of clattering crockery back to the workshop. When that door closed, she forced herself to wait a few more seconds, just to be on the safe side. Then she crept back out into the hallway. There was a sign, a sign hanging on the door of Mo's workshop, a small metal plaque. Maggie knew the words on it by heart. When she was five, she'd often practiced reading the old-fashioned spindly lettering. Some books should be tasted, some devoured but only a few should be chewed and digested thoroughly. Back then, when she still had to climb in a box to read the plaque, she had thought of chewing and digesting were meant literally, and she wondered, horrified, why Mo had hung in a sign on his workshop, the words of someone who vandalized books. Now she knew what the plaque really meant, but tonight she wasn't interested in written words. Spoken words were what she wanted to hear, the words being exchanged in soft, almost inaudible whispers by two men on the other side of the door. Don't underestimate him, she heard Dustfinger say. His voice was so different from Moe's. No one else in the world had a voice like her father. Mo could paint pictures in the empty air with his voice alone. He'd do anything to get a hold of it. That was Dustfinger again, and when I say anything, I can assure you I mean anything. I'll never let him have it. That was Mo. He'll still get his hands on it one way or another. I tell you, they're on your trail. It wouldn't be the first time. And I've always managed to shake them off before. Oh, yes? And for how much longer do you think? What about your daughter? Are you telling me she actually likes moving around the whole time? Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. 
It wasn't so quiet behind the door that Maggie scarcely... It was so quiet behind the door that Maggie scarcely dared to breathe in case the two men heard her. Finally, her father spoke again hesitantly, as if his tongue found it difficult to form the words. Then what do you think I ought to do? Come with me. I'll take you to them. A cup clinked, the sound of spoon against china. How loud small noises sound in silence. You know how much Capricorn thinks of your talents. He'd be glad if you took it to him of your own free will. I'm sure he would. The man he found to replace you is useless. Capricorn. Another peculiar name. Dustfinger had uttered it as if the mere sound might scorch his tongue. Maggie wriggled her chilly toes and wrinkled her cold nose. She didn't understand much of what the two men were saying, but she tried to memorize every single word of it. It was quiet again in the workshop. Oh, I don't know, said Mo at last. He sounded so weary it tore at Maggie's heart. I'll have to think about it. When do you think his men will get here? Soon. The word dropped like a stone into the silence. Soon, repeated Mo. Very well. I'll have made up my mind by tomorrow. Do you have somewhere to sleep? Oh, I can always find a place, replied Dustfinger. I'm managing quite well these days, although it's still all much too fast for me. His laugh was not a happy one. But I'd like to know what you decide. May I come back tomorrow? About midday? Yes, of course. I'll be picking Maggie up from school at one thirty. Come after that. Maggie heard a chair being pushed back and scurried back to her room. When the door of the workshop opened, she was just closing her bedroom door behind her. Pulling the covers up to her chin, she lay there listening as her father said goodbye to Dustfinger. And thank you, for the warning anyway. She heard him add as Dustfinger's footsteps moved away, slowly and uncertainly as if he were reluctant to leave, as if he hadn't said everything he wanted to say. But at last he was gone. And, the only, and only the rain kept drumming its wet fingers on Maggie's window. When Mo opened the door of her room, she quickly closed her eyes and tried to breathe as slowly as you do in a deep, innocent sleep. But Mo wasn't stupid. In fact, he was sometimes terribly clever. Maggie, put one of your feet out of bed, he told her. Reluctantly, she stuck her toes out from under the blanket and laid them into Mo's warm hand. They were still cold. I knew it, he said. You've been spying. Can't you just do as I tell you, just for once? Sighing, he stuck her foot back underneath the nice warm blankets. Then he sat down on her bed, passed his hands over his tired face, and looked out the window. His hair was dark as moleskin. Maggie had fair hair, like her mother, whom she only knew from a few faded photographs. You should be glad you look more like her than me, Mo always said. My head wouldn't look good on all. My head wouldn't look good at all on a girl's neck. But Maggie wished she did look more like him. There wasn't a face in the world she loved more. I didn't hear what you were saying anyway, she murmured. Good. Mo stared out the window as if Dustfinger was still standing in the yard. Then he rose and went to the door. Try to get some sleep, he said. But Maggie didn't want to sleep. Dustfinger! What sort of a name is that, she asked, and, and why does he call you Silvertongue? Mo did not reply. And this person who's looking for you, I heard what Dustfinger called him, Capricorn. Who is he? No one you want to meet. Her father didn't turn around. I thought you didn't hear anything. Good night, Maggie. This time he left her door open. The light from the hallway fell in her bed, mingling with the darkness of the night that seeped through the window, and Maggie lay there waiting for the dark to disappear and to take the fear of some evil menace away with it. Only later did she understand that the evil had not appeared for the first time that night. It had just slunk back in again. And that's the end of the first chapter of an amazing and magical book. Uh, I can't tell you how many lines I have underlined in this story simply because the language is so beautiful. So um, if you are entranced and you would like to read the rest, I highly encourage you to pick up a copy. There are links in the description box for you. Um, happy reading, and I hope to see you back again for another First Chapter Friday. video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe.